Hey guys, I am so excited to announce that the movie that you've been waiting for, the documentary Dr. Patient, is now available for rent or purchase at drpatientmovie.com. Check out the trailer here. When I really knew something was wrong was when I started having trouble walking up the stairs. I was supposed to be grateful and happy and healing and well and thriving, but I did not feel that way. I was so sick. Like always, I wanted to find an answer and I had to figure it out, and I had to figure it out to save my own life. So I dove in. Jill is the leading voice in biotoxin illness and chronic conditions that are driven by toxicity. Oh my gosh, you're dealing with mold? You have to work with Dr. Jill Carnahan. Dr. Jill was the first person that actually began to shed some light on the problem. What I do is listen to the patient and we together talk about what else is possible. I don't know why I'm crying. <laughs> she saved my life. The deepest lessons and most profound insights come in the suffering, come in the dark moments. Self-compassion is the healing transition that, that shifts something inside of us. It's actually the thing that we need most in order to heal. Dr. Patient. Available now at drpatientmovie.com. Welcome to Resiliency Radio, your go-to podcast for the most cutting-edge information in functional and integrative medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Jill, and with each episode, we dive into the heart of healing and personal transformation. Join us as we connect to renowned experts, thought leaders, and innovators who are at the forefront of medical research and practice, empowering you on your journey to optimal healing. Hey guys, if you don't already know, um, I don't know where you've been at, maybe head in the sand, but my movie, Dr. Patient, is now out and you can watch it, you can gift it, you can share it. I am hoping that it inspires you on your journey. It's at drpatientmovie.com and be sure and take a look, check it out, and I would love to hear your feedback. Okay, today I want to introduce my guest, and I'm so excited. I've been looking forward to this interview for a long time. Um, Christina is a national trial lawyer who represents sick people against the companies that made them sick. She founded Just Well Law to help clients recover financially so that they can help rebuild their health and their lives. After tragedy hit her own family, she returned to plaintiff's side and founded Just Well Law to help other families in crisis. She built the personal injury firm so she could find her um, that she couldn't find for her own family. Health and wellness require financial resources, and Christina is relentless in pursuing the maximum recovery for her clients because she has been there as well. She attended Princeton University and Yale Law School and is committed to using law as a tool of empowerment to help other people. I know you guys can't wait to get into this, so we're going to get right into it. Christina, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I'm so glad to be here. Yeah. So let's start with your story of, I always love to, how do people get into what they're doing? And obviously you have a personal story that dealt with mold, but before that, um, did you always want to be an attorney and how did you get into the practice of law? So, so I'm going to start at the end, which is that I was poisoned in the house that I was living in, which is why I'm here. Um, before that, I always wanted to be a lawyer since I was a little girl. I, I, and, and it's interesting that my Current work helping families in environmental recovery is very much a, aligned with where I started. When I graduated from college, I worked in Uganda and I helped people living with HIV and AIDS. And they were trying to find their economic freedom through economic empowerment tools. I did that. Um, and then I went to law school at Yale. And after Yale, I worked in Liberia and set up a sex crimes prosecution unit. So I spent a lot of time in community organizing and empowerment sphere. And then I went to patent litigation, which is completely different. And I did that for a long time. Um, and I learned really high stakes federal litigation skills. And I started not feeling well. Mm -hmm. And I know you know this story, but I started feeling dizzy. And I had just made partner and was kind of coming up. It was that season when I was making partner and thought maybe it was just stress. I started going to a lot of different doctors. This was 2017, had migraines that wouldn't go away, 
had never had migraines in my life before, had these rashes that wouldn't go away. Um, at some point, someone thought maybe it was testosterone. So they were giving me testosterone pellets. I mean, I, it was really anything that I could figure out. Doctor after doctor, maybe you should consider leaving the practice of law or reducing stress in your life. Um, so I did that. In an effort to get well, I went to the U.S. Attorney's Office and I was Christina 2.0. I was doing government work and I was slowing down and I was taking care of my body. It was gluten-free, sugar-free, dairy-free. You would be so proud of me. Um, and I got sicker. Uh. And then they sent us to quarantine at home and I got sicker. And, you know, that was summer, that was spring of 2020 when everyone is inside yes. all the time. And I started seeing my kids regress in their milestones, but I couldn't focus on any of that because my computer screen would get blurry. I thought of driving into oncoming traffic. I couldn't figure out what was going on with me. These were not thoughts I'd had before, not just the fuzziness, right? Just the, the fuzziness and confusion and um, feeling like I'd been hit by a truck. And I finally met a doctor named Dr. Picardo who gave me a bunch of different tests and mycotoxins was just one of them. I'd never heard of mycotoxins before and ultimately found the root of the problem, which is that we were living in a house that was slowly poisoning our family. Wow. Uh, and we just briefly talked before coming on how these kinds of circumstances in our lives, it's not like we choose them or that we feel like they were, you know, happened to us like that in that sense. Um, but there's this destiny thing uh, that when we take what our suffering is in our families and ourselves and turn it around and figure things out and then go and make a change in the world. And that is what you are doing. It's my story too. I never, I always say I never was going to be the mold doctor, but then I got really, really sick and I had to figure it out to save my own life. And you did the same thing. You had to figure it out to save your family's life. So what was that like as an attorney, all of a sudden realizing what was happening and then go into the legal aspects because that's where it really gets tricky, doesn't it? Well, I was doing personal injury defense for the United States, which was actually a new field for me. I had been in patent litigation before, and like I said, in Africa before that, so I had never done personal injury work. But I knew a case from the defensive side when I saw one, and here we were, a family of six, two pretty special kids. You know, we have four kids, but two of them were having a really hard time. One of them was running into walls and had bruises all over his forehead. We lost our house and everything in it. Surely that's a case. Liability yeah. is clear. I mean, there is black mold. You can see it in my daughter's wall, right? Um, and we started peeling back the layers of that case. And it's a construction case. Yes. And the, the walls weren't flashed properly. The roofer had told the builder, I didn't flash the chimney because... The mason wasn't here. And the builder's foreman looked at him and said, just rig it, just make, do it on the outside. So they did it on the outside and then water came into that wall. That was my daughter's wall. And we have great pictures of, you know, the beautiful pink and white striped wall on one side and on yes. the other side, just completely black disintegrated wall. Um, and that's where she had been coloring all day, every day during COVID, during the shutdowns. So no wonder she had kind of become crazy, right? And no violent. Wonder. So and no wonder. Um, so so we moved out of our house. That was the first step, right? Of it of just getting well is which you know that's hard to do, actually. That's not easy. And I I want to tell your listeners, because I know that there are people who are listening who are in a toxic house right now. And I know you think you can't afford to leave. And I want to tell you, you cannot afford to stay. You cannot afford to stay. And that was kind of what the place that I came to with our own house is like, we, this, this house is going to, you know, this house is, we're not well. And, and I think that that house would have killed us because by, by the time we left, I had a tumor I collapsed and was taken to the emergency room. I had internal bleeding that I couldn't figure out where it was coming from. I mean, I was, I was a physical mess and we can talk about why that is. There's a cytokine storm and it attacks every organ in your body and all the things, but I was so sick. 
Um, and I started building the case against the people that poisoned our family. And as I was doing that, I re realized that there weren't very many other lawyers who were doing it. And I couldn't, lawyers in Texas would not even take my call. I mean, not even, if they were a personal injury lawyer in Texas and I was calling just, hey, I'm another lawyer, I am at the U.S. Attorney's Office, which is, you know, means I'm legit, right? Exactly. <laughs> hey, you know, do you think you could just spend 15 minutes with me? I mean, there's a guy here who has on his website that he does mold cases. He only does wrongful death cases. And he wouldn't even return my email. Didn't return my phone call. Didn't return my emails. Didn't, couldn't even take 15 minutes of his time to talk to me. And I thought, you know what? He can have the dead people. And I'm going to start a practice and I'm going to help the people who are alive because they need help. People out there need help. So, and, and to be fair, I was also sick. So I thought maybe I'll just start a practice and I'll just help a couple of families and do a few cases at a time. I hired one paralegal. CNBC did a story on our family around them, linked to my website. My website was maybe two weeks old. It had been created by my 13 year old the week before. I love this. I got a thousand calls in two weeks. Yeah. And there was just this tremendous need because there's nobody else or very few people out there doing it. Um, well, that's how I found you. I heard, I saw an article. I don't think it was that one, but there's been many different podcasts and articles. And when I saw that, I thought I need to talk to you because every day it's this conversation with patients. And I always say, I'm not a remediator, but I can get you started and point you in the right direction to people who are experts. Same with legal, except that there was no one that I could give those calls and those questions too. And I literally so often have sat in front of a patient and said, you know what, it's not even worth pursuing it. I don't know of anyone who will take these cases. So why is that? I mean, you and I know the the climate and the culture, but tell us from an attorney's perspective um, what you've seen and why this is such a tragedy. Well, so, so first of all, we will take the call yeah. because those lawyers wouldn't return my call. So I now have an incredible intake director. Her name is Casey McCurry and she's a survivor herself. And she will take your call. Whether, awesome. you have, whether you have a case or not, we take cases from, we take calls from around the country. We share our resources, which you're on, Dr. Jill. Um, you know, I share what I wish I had known. And if I do nothing else in the world, if my firm makes no money, I will be so thankful that I got to share with probably a thousand people so far, just what I wish I had known, because I didn't know anything. I didn't know anyone who had done this, had been there before, Evan and I have five Ivy League degrees. None of us, we, neither of us had ever heard the word stachybotrys. Yes. And that's because there is a massive cover up in this country and it's intentional. And um, the reason that these cases failed is because the bad guys won for a long time. And they convinced the world, the legal world, that this was junk science. And by the way, they convinced the plaintiff's lawyers too. The plaintiff's lawyers have been trained to think that this is junk science and that anyone who calls with a mold problem is a little bit cray cray. And so the gaslighting is from the defense bar, but it's equally from the plaintiff's bar. And so you have patients, I'm sure, who've called five or six different lawyers, maybe 10 lawyers, maybe 20 lawyers, and all of them either don't get a call back or get kind of a, yeah, sorry, good luck. You know, we don't do those cases. Um, I've actually been the medical the expert. Guy. I was going to say, I've had several patients where I've actually testified to their medical case in detail, proving beyond a shadow of a doubt that their medical illness was related to the mold. And none of them have won so far again to get until I met you, but oh, that's terrible. I think they must not. They, so, so, and, um, I, these cases can be won. Yeah. They absolutely can be won. What we're finding, and even in my own case, so I've just, we've, we've won the last six motions for summary judgment in Texas um, in a state where they used to say you could never win a mold case, uh -huh. we, you know, dominated the last six attempts to shut us down. And the reason is this is now universally accepted. The World Health Organization has a diagnostic code, Z, whatever. Yes. I'm sure you put it on every single one of your um, patients' forms. But 
this is universally accepted. It, it's not junk science. It's not even controversial. Okay. It's controversial amongst the experts, but it's not controversial when you look at the medical literature. I started just reading PubMed myself when this happened to me and I'm finding, you know, okay. So, so we talk about sears or complex inflammation and I'm thinking, well, is that real? The people online say it's not real. Well, if you go to the medical literature, it's there. Yeah. It's systemic inflammation caused by mycotoxins. It's stachybotrys, it's chitomium. It is, it is in peer reviewed literature and it's real and it's not on someone's website. It's PubMed peer reviewed um, publications and, and, it's, and it's real. And so I had to prove to myself that it was real for my own psyche. And of course, now I go out into the world and I'm just, I just say, this is obvious. Yeah. And there was a conservative case, a conservative judge recently, and it was actually my associate who's wonderful, his name's Mason. And he went and argued the summary judgment motion and summary judgment, by the way, means when the defense is trying to shut down the case and says, you don't have the requisite evidence. And they usually say, mold is junk science. You can't prove dose and duration, you lose. Um, and so this, this conservative judge looks at the defense counsel and says, well, this plaintiff has a mold expert who says that there was mold in the house, mold inspector, and a doctor who says that she got sick because there's mold in the house. What else could you possibly need? And it's just, you know, wow, in 2024, we have gotten to a place with even a conservative judge where you need a mold inspector yeah. and a doctor. Yes. And that's it. This is not rocket science, people. This is World Health Organization stuff. Mm -hmm. This is basic. This is this is Wikipedia at this point. Um, and juries know. Yes. And if you do a mock jury, every single juror will tell you, yes, mold causes harm. You don't have to convince them. So if we could just get past the lawyers and the judges yeah. to the jury, the jury believes. The jury oh. believes. Hey, everybody. I just stopped by to let you know that my new book, Unexpected, Finding Resilience Through Functional Medicine, Science, and Faith, is now available for order wherever you purchase books. In this book, I share my own journey of overcoming life-threatening illness and the tools and tips and tricks and hope and resilience I found along the way. This book includes practical advice for things like cancer and Crohn's disease and other autoimmune conditions, infections like Lyme or Epstein-Barr and mold and biotoxin related illness. What I really hope is that as you read this book, you find transformational wisdom for health and healing. If you want to get your own copy, stop by readunexpected.com. There you can also collect your free bonuses. So grab your copy today and begin your own transformational journey through functional medicine in finding resilience. So how did you get your case one first? And then how did you go from there to get, because this is again, fascinating to me because I've seen in my cases have been several years ago where there really was a lot of gaslighting. And I mean, it was horrible. I, I will, I want to help my patients, but I try to avoid the, the system because it's so, uh, it's to me, it's mind blowing because I know the science like you, I know the clear, clear pathway. I can describe it very eloquently. And yet I still get this like, disbelief or um, gaslighting. And that's what you're up against as well. That's what I'm up against. So, so in my own case, um, I'll be honest with you, it's the only case in Texas that we have lost on the science. All my other cases were winning and were proving injury. But in my own case, the judge said, you don't have dose and duration. Uh. And how can you prove an exact level of dose that you're exposed to? And exa for exactly how long you can't, you just can't, right? It's, it's not, it's not possible and it's not required. Correct. It's not required. Um, and it hasn't been required in any of my other cases, except for my own. Wow. But that's why we present these cases as deceptive trade practices cases. Mm -hmm. So I have to show you this. This is in the middle of my trial the jury sent back a question and it says, 
the jury asks the following question. Can incompetence be considered a false, misleading, or deceptive act? Wow. And the, answer, the answer was yes. They <laughs> sound yes. Yeah. <laughs> incompetence can be a deceptive act. But in all my other cases, um, I have I have incompetence. I have incompetence. I have a landlord who will come in and gaslight you and say, you know what? That vent just looks a little bit dirty. I'm going to take it down for you and I'm just going to clean it. Right. Clean it. And then you put it back up and they leave and they're like, it's all clean for you. Right. And that that is a deceptive act. Yeah. Or we're going to paint over it, right? We're going to, oh, let me know. just paint over right. that, that nasty mold. Let me paint over it, right? Like what kind of... <laughs> they know that the bad stuff is behind the vent. Mm -hmm. That's a whole system full of black crap, right? But the, the, the gaslighting and the deception is real and it makes juries very upset. Uh. So... I go into these mediations and the defendant wants to make it about my client and can my client prove dose and duration and the science and all that stuff. And my answer is like, I don't care. I don't care because what is a jury going to do with the fact that you knew that that place was toxic Yes, and you let them move into it? What's a jury going to do with that? Yeah. If my own case found $700,000 in exemplary damages for an HVAC company that didn't connect a wire. Because at the end of my trial, I just ended up going for the HVAC company because I settled out with the other parties. So the HVAC company didn't have anything clearly intentional, yeah, but it didn't connect a wire. And the jury found 700 grand in exemplary damages. Well, if that's 700,000, what's a jury gonna do with the landlord who painted over the toxic substance, mm -hmm. right? So I make it about, these cases are about the defendants. Yes, my client got injured, but I'm telling a jury, you have to stand up for safety because that's what the system is designed for. If you, if my client doesn't take a stand and if jury, you don't enforce the law, then we're gonna have more landlords that allow more families to move into more toxic apartments. It has to stop and we have a way to stop it. And when you present it like that. I, I'm getting goosebumps because I'm so, I love this. It really is about, and what the problem is, is the most common um, places that are affected by mold now are new construction, which means there is an epidemic of poor quality, poor communication, poor craftsmanship, errors and just like your chimney that wasn't flashed that is actually the norm rather than the exception and i just want to say i know you see this as well this doesn't matter if it's a you know fixer upper or a multi-million dollar structure in fact i see some of the most expensive beautiful homes and they are absolutely wrecked with mold and the other thing that you said that I think is so important is your daughter's beautiful pink and white wall. People look at their house so often and they're like, everything's fine. It looks good. And cosmetically, contractors can make things look beautiful, but it's actually inside where the people who buy that house don't know where there's either toxic mold or the damages that weren't correctly, you know, or the um, construction that wasn't done correctly. And that, I mean, that gives me goosebumps because my house was so pretty. I loved my house um, and it's going to take a lot of therapy over a long time to ever come back to the concept of home. Yes. Right. That was you. Families have the right to expect safe air in their home. Yes. And especially in the coast post COVID world mm -hmm. where home was in our, in our um, jury selection, Bob McKee, who's my lawyer and, He's amazing. He's from Florida, but he asked these jurors, potential jurors, what do you think about when you think about home? Oasis, cocoon, safety, family, yes. food, right? And then he said, now I'm going to take you back to COVID. What did you think about home during COVID? And it was health. Mm -hmm. Safety, 
again, right? The one place we could feel safe. Yes. And he said, now what would, ha- you know, how would you feel if your home was taken away during COVID? So I'm going to, some of those jurors were so upset by that very question that they couldn't serve on the jury. Wow. It went too, it like almost went too far. Right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, because they were like, I, I can't be objective here. Yeah. I mean, ho- it because home, home is everything. Home is where our family is. And for our family, that was, it was so pretty. Yeah. And it felt, I'm from the Northeast and it was this home in Texas that looked like it was right out of Connecticut. And it just had this banister going upstairs. And look, I, I never mentioned my builder's name out loud because he didn't want to poison my family. He didn't set out to poison my family. He built this beautiful house, but he built it with spray foam. And that was in the beginning yes. of spray foam with an HVAC system that was supposed to be designed to dehumidify. But the HVAC company didn't set it up right, so it wasn't dehumidifying. That's that wire I just yes. mentioned. Yes. And then he had a designer and not an architect, and the designer only had flashing in two places. And then those two places were flashed incorrectly, and the rest of the house wasn't flashed at all. So you have a well-meaning person who builds a beautiful house, who happens to build a very toxic house. So this is actually really important because we can go with most kinds of cases that I've dealt with too as patients, um, of my patients. And most of the time there is not a deliberately malicious intent. And again, you would know the legal terms for this stuff, but the truth is that negligence is actually just as bad and it's just as devastating. I love that you're saying that because I don't want to say that all contractors have an evil intent. Most of them don't. They want to build beautiful things, but I do believe there's more shortcuts and there's more untrained. I think our workforce is less trained. I remember not too long ago, a friend of mine went into her house that was being built and the guy who was doing the shower pan was watching a, a YouTube video while she was walking by of how to install it. Like he had never done it before. He had, and shower pans, as you know, and showers themselves are such big mold things. And she was horrified that this, you know, and he looked like he was in his early 20s. He might, who knows? I don't want to judge here, but it was like, okay, the quality of craftsmanship and and knowing what you're doing really matters. And that's the contractor's job. So these are, it's negligence, I guess, is that the legal term here versus like- So it's it's negligence. So um, it's negligence, but it's it's choices, right? There are choices being made and we, whether it's negligence or intentional, we have to say something. Mm -hmm. It's like, if I'm driving too fast and I'm not looking at my- you know, I'm, I'm not looking at the road and I hit somebody, I'm liable for that. I didn't mean to, I didn't do it intentionally, but we have to live in a society where you're responsible for the harm that you cause. Yes. That's the society that we have to live in. And that's not greedy. That's not, that, that's, that's the way that our, our world works. Yeah. And here we have a human element like air, or in Hawaii, we talk about that too, I'm working on a water case, but but this element of air, it's not something that you can mess with. And if we don't hold the negligent builders responsible or the negligent landlords responsible, then it, there's not going to be any change, yeah. right? So, so... I can guarantee that my builder is never going to build another house with spray foam without an HVAC properly calibrated because he poisoned a family. He didn't mean to, but somebody has to pay for that. And it's, and, and, and you want to live in that society. That's the society that you want to live in. We want to be able to expect that a landlord will provide safe air. We need to be able to expect that if a landlord finds that the air isn't safe, that it will fix it right away. Yes. We need to live in a world where a builder knows how to provide safe air. 
And if the builder doesn't know how to provide safe air, the builder should not be building houses. Yes. Kind of like, you know, messing. I have a great case where, I mean, it's a terrible case, but it's a, it's a strong case where a water mitigation company came in and did a job and they said, listen, there wasn't enough insurance money to do a good job. So we didn't, we just weren't able to dry it out all the way. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I, I, uh, if you're not able to do it the right way, it's like, it's like correcting the brakes of a car. Yes. Yeah. Don't, don't mess with the brakes if you don't have the right parts. The answer is not to do it at all right. because you, you can't do it halfway. Mm -hmm. In this case, doing a water mitigation job halfway because they just had to cut some corners because they didn't have the right kind of money, built a, an entire house with extreme levels of stacky botrys in every single wall. Oh. Because the waters, the walls were left wet. Wow. And you had, I have a picture of a baby with welts all over it. You know, so we we have to live in a world with clean air and, and clean water and yeah. safe, safe air. So this is, uh, I love this. This is my spiel, clean air, clean water, clean food. And it starts with that. And I loved what you start with COVID because in the house thing, because I always feel that way. Like people who have mold related illness are so traumatized because when it's your home, it is literally a violation of your most sacred place of safety. And it's invisible and it's horrendously toxic and it can harm not only yourself, your brain, your whole family. And, and yet it's this invisible thing. And so it's, it's on every level, it's so evil. <laughs> it's just awful, in, right? <laughs> in my own case, I was able to, to talk, even though I wasn't able to talk about injury, I was able to talk about the mental injury of losing the house. And that's a fine line, right? What is, what is injury and what is mental injury? But um, I have a wonderful doctor, Dr. Storage from the Amon Clinic in California residency from Stanford, really great. The best kind of expert you have, you want in any given case is one with all those great degrees. Mm -hmm. And he showed the jury the spec scans of our brains. And he was able to say, this is the trauma. Yes, There is a double brain injury that happens when you're poisoned at home. There's the brain injury from the exposure, from the poison, whether it's the air or the water or whatever it is, but then there's the injury of the trauma mm -hmm. of being displaced, yeah. of losing your safe place, of doing, and, you know, particularly in the middle of COVID. So you have this double brain injury and we want to be able to educate juries more about that too. This is not, this is not just like you get the sniffles and the women's health or uh, article that just came out recently, that maybe one of the ones you read, I was so proud of that because that that journalist was able to get into the brain impact of toxic exposure. And I remember when that CNBC article was coming out in our family now um, three years ago, it was a stretch yeah. for that editor to include all the all the brain health. And she did. But only when I provided the peer-reviewed literature and I connected her to Dr. Professor Dr. Jamie Lichtenstein. And, you know, I was able to say, no, really, this affects the brain. Because otherwise they're looking at the CDC website and they're like, this causes asthma. Yeah. You know? And, and not, it, asthma is very real and very important, right. but this causes brain injury. Yeah, now people have heard me enough, but I want to clarify that point because anyone listening that's new, this is so critical. So a couple of things. First of all, you mentioned this early and we both understand typical in medical school as a medical doctor, we're taught that um, a mold is an allergen, uh, causes asthma, allergies, congestion, rashes, those kinds of things. That's true. However, what you and I are talking about, what we see in your clients and my patients is this innate immune response. It's literally the immune system senses this massive threat and starts to activate. It's the same reason why people died 
from COVID is their immune system got activated. It caused attack of self and went runaway. And this, all these cytokines and inflammatory things can cause damage to the brain, to the kidneys, to the neurological system. I have seen people present with ALS and MS and autoimmune disease of any type you could name, severe immune deficiency, and I could go cancer, I, on and on and on of the kinds of things that mold can actually cause. And like you said, this is in the literature. So this is not controversial. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention is when I was writing my book, I did the research on the brain mold connection. And one thing I came across that was what you're saying, but it's actually in the literature is there is literally a, a chemical limbic effect. So basically when we inhale toxins like mold toxins through our nose, it goes directly through the cribriform plate to the brain and activates the limbic system, the fight or flight system, the fear response. So even if we're like, we're saying that this is traumatic, but even if we are like somehow like, okay, it's okay. I'm going to have to leave my house. Even if you were uh, emotionally sound, you felt like you were okay, there's still a chemical limbic threat response that you cannot control, which means I believe that 100% of my patients that have ever dealt with mold have PTSD. What's your thoughts on that? <laughs> I mean, yes to everything you just said. You said it so so eloquently. Um, and it's uh, the PTSD is real. And, and so the way you you framed it is so important because it yes the trauma of it causes damage but don't get me wrong it's the toxic exposure that also causes brain damage yes so don't let someone gaslight you, audience, into thinking that you just have some sort of psychosomatic disease. This is not a psychosomatic disease. This is real exposure that causes real injury. And it just so happens that that also causes a psychological response in addition, right? But that's, and that's, so every defendant in a toxic exposure case, and we can talk about Hawaii too, Every defendant ha says this, there wasn't enough to cause real harm, but clearly you're having some sort of reaction. Yeah. So that must be a psychosomatic response. Ah, that makes me so, so angry. <laughs> so in my own case, um, Dr. I forget his name, Gonzalez, I think yeah. this guy in San Antonio did a, um, a neuropsych exam with me and finds that I'm psychosomatic, that I have a somatic disorder is what he, what he diagnosed. Well, if you look up somatic disorder, and this is the defendant in my case, by the way, that orders this exam. Yes. yes. And I had a neuropsych exam with an expert on my side. And I got so upset, Jill, because it's really upsetting to have someone call you psychosomatic. Like, I don't know. I have two Ivy League degrees. Does that matter? I, I'm not a crazy person. I don't think. Agreed. And I think I thought that I was immune from being called crazy because of my academic background. And maybe if I was really smarty pants and came forth and, you know, charged into the mold world that nobody could call me crazy. Yeah. And then here is this expert saying that I have a somatic disorder. It was really upsetting. And I had to go back to my doctor's and say, is there any part of this that could, that could be true? Like, could this be in my head? How upsetting is that? That's but my own lawyer took the, psych, the neuropsych results and I had two tests on my side because I did one with the Amen Clinic and then I did one with my expert. And then he took the other guy's tests and it turned out that they all matched perfectly. Wow. My processing speed was low. Yeah. My short-term memory recall was low. Yeah. So even though he called it a somatic disorder, every symptom that I was describing was actually borne out by the independent tests that he did. And documented, which is exactly what and happened. documented, right? Yeah. There it is in black and white. I truly, and of course he couldn't call me malingering because I passed the validity test. I was really trying hard in the test. Yeah. So he didn't call me, but that's what they do. That's what they do. So it was very upsetting to me when the freaking government in my Hawaii case, so back up, 
In Hawaii, the government Let's contaminated the water. This is important. Go ahead. The United States contaminated the water. The Navy contaminated the water with jet fuel. There was a huge spill. It happened right next to the water source. They called it contained. They said the water remains safe. They didn't test the water. They said, carry on. Okay. Eight days later, people start smelling fuel in the water. The government goes out, smells at people's houses. The water director says, yes, it must be related to this event that happened last week. I mean, this is not this is not rocket science. You know, people are smelling the fuel. We got to let everybody know. Well, instead of warning everyone to stop using the water, they did the opposite. They told people there's no indication the water's not safe. Wow. Then um, for two weeks, they held town halls where people came forth and they said, but we smell fuel in the water. They said, no, 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 there's no indication it's not safe. You can, you can shower. As long as you don't smell it, you can still shower. You should be fine. We're investigating. Uh. And they waited until the test results that came back. Well, if you know anything about public health 101, you're not allowed to wait for test results. You have to, you have to advise of the risk and you have to advise of a health risk within 24 hours of a major contamination event. This is again, not hard. Google EPA water notice, water advisory. It's very clear. The requirements are very clear within 24 hours to all users of the Navy water line, of any water line. The problem in this case too, is not only did they not issue a warning, but once they started to issue the warnings, they only issued it to certain neighborhoods. They waited for people to get sick in those neighborhoods and call in because they could say, well, it's not the whole line, it's only neighborhoods. So they waited for the other neighborhoods to get sick. So now here we are two and a half years later, 7,000 people had medical encounters that the government documented in real time with acute symptoms that the government itself tracked to the water contamination. Wow. So CDC came in, ATSDR came in, they all did studies, they found thousands of people were sick, they were still sick a year later, symptoms are ongoing, the VA is now taking claims, and DOJ has the audacity to come into federal court and say, hire an expert, her name's Dr. Pruitt, and she testified that there was not enough fuel to make anyone sick, there's not enough fuel to have a toxicological effect. And therefore, anyone who had symptoms must have been somatic, oh. S-M-A-T-I-C. It's the same stuff, right? It's the it same it stuff. Like, we can't have dose and duration, therefore must be psychosomatic. Mm. And they took that position, even though they had 7,000 people. So I can't help but be offended. I'm offended. I'm offended for my clients. Why? Because maybe I'm a little bit triggered by that PTSD response, right? <laughs> like, don't call my clients crazy. Oh, and, and from a doctor perspective, I've been on, I've not been in the courtroom as much as you, but in my clinic, we see the same thing where either other doctors tell the patient, oh, it's all in your head. Or so I see the same thing. And I literally see these patients walk in and I say, tell me your story. And I validate them. And almost to a T, they're in tears because someone is finally saying, I believe you. How awful is it that we have to go to 20 doctors to find someone or or a thousand attorneys <laughs> the same way for both of us? We're on the same side of this as far as seeing these patients who have been belittled and gaslit and told that it's all in their head or that it's psychosomatic. And it is a tragedy, Christina. Like that's why I love the work that you're doing. And I'm so want to support you because it is so needed. And only when you start winning these cases are the contractors and the people building and the landlords and the US government going to start actually changing behavior. Right. And 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 that's what I, you know, that it was tricky at trial. So I just came back from trial. I had a 10-day trial in, in Hawaii. Um and I got to present 17 stories of our clients. Each one affected a little bit differently, but every single one of them had acute symptoms in real time. Vomiting, nausea, diarrhea, rashes. 
And I put up a picture of the little puppy who had seizures. And I said, were his seizures psychosomatic? Yeah. I mean, were are the rashes psychosomatic? I mean, how can you ignore an event that happened to thousands of people? How can you actually have the audacity to come in here and say it's it's on their head? I mean, really? Um, and, and that's not what's upsetting, I think, is that that's not the position they had to take. Yeah. That's not that that's not the position I would have taken if I were them. And you know, when they came to trial, it was they 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 tiptoed around that. They were like, well, maybe we won't use the word psychosomatic this time. Maybe we'll use stress induced. Oh. Well, what causes stress, Jill? Yeah. Okay, let's call it all stress induced. So 7,000 people had acute poisoning symptoms and we're going to call it all stress induced. Okay. What caused the stress? Right. Was it that you poisoned them in the homes they lived in? Yeah. You think that caused a stress response? Because it certainly did. And that gets back to that conversation we were having earlier that makes me a little bit nervous mm -hmm. because there is a trauma response. Yes. Yes. And trauma does have a physiological dynamic. Yes. But that doesn't negate the very real toxic exposure response yeah. or immune response to a toxin, yes. the cytokine storm that happens. Yes. So it's very um, it's very important to believe these clients. And I have the reason I have this case and other lawyers don't is because I believed them. Mm -hmm. I showed up on that island and I was sick myself. You know, I talked about those thousand calls that came in. One was from Hawaii. Oh, and I, I wondered how you got involved, but to me, it's all the same because I'm the same thing in clean air, clean water, clean food and environmental toxicity is all about our physical health. And for you, you're doing the same thing, even though someone may be like Hawaiian mold, it's the same kind of client, isn't it's it? It's the same. And so, so I had just been to Congress with military families advocating for military housing, for safe housing. Oh, yeah. And what I was saying up in Congress is we can't be mission ready if our people are sick mm -hmm. by definition. If our families are sick, military families are sick, they can't be mission ready. We can't send someone off into battle. He's not gonna be, he or she is not gonna be their whole selves if they're thinking about at home. And heaven forbid they have that same kind of neurotoxicity stuff that I had when I wanted to drive into traffic. Yeah, You don't want that person driving, flying a plane. Right. Right? You don't want that person in the Air Force with the, that kind of brain fog and yeah. neuro stuff going on. So I, when I was up there is when the Red Hill fuel spill happened. So I knew a little bit about it. So when I got that call from Hawaii, I thought that's probably what this is. Yeah. And I flew over there and I started seeing a whole bunch of people who looked just like me. And I started hearing the Navy saying, oh no, it's jet fuel. It's in and out of your body. 48 hours. That The, the half-life of JP5 yeah. is 48 hours. And therefore, it's not going to affect you long term. Mm. And I'm looking at PubMed because now I know how to do it myself, right? Yes. I go up to PubMed, read the literature myself. Right. And I was holding up Wikipedia and these PubMed articles and saying, this is not rocket science. This is real. Jet fuel has a real effect. Mm -hmm. And what's really sad is one of the main pieces of literature, there are two pieces of literature that I cited at the time. One was vestibular dysfunction. And one was the effect on children and cognitive development of children. And both of them two and a half years later proved to be true. Mm -hmm. I've got clients, many, many clients with vestibular dysfunction now yeah. and many, many children who are developmentally delayed. Are they delayed because of the trauma? Mm. Are they delayed because of the exposure? Mm -hmm. Does it matter? Well, that's okay. I love that you just said doesn't matter because at the core here, first of all, I want to just reiterate what you and I have both said for those listening. There is a real chemical toxic effect on the brain. You can take even the work of Dale Bredesen, who's one of the brilliant researchers in the field of Alzheimer's. I teach with him. I have spoken with him. And he used to say one in three people that are young that develop Alzheimer's is related to mold. He's now recently quoted as maybe one in two, like 50%. So we know that mold has a massive effect on cognition, but what you and I are saying is there's literally a chemical trauma response, but then back to the, which came first, does it really matter if there, because if there is a real stress response with these chemical things, 
um, and the chemical itself might be causing a cortisol or an HP axis dysfunction or a limbic response, as I quoted in that article. Well, then it's all connected and it doesn't matter if the brain responds with stress. It's still a chemical causation, right? <laughs> well, from my perspective, it's still, it's caused from the yeah. fact that yeah. you dump jet fuel into their water. Right. Well, it's not <laughs> still, exactly. You know? And I have to be very, in, you know, in front of a judge, I can be very like direct and, you know, but this is like not rocket science people. Right. And yeah. that's this, when you're talking to a fact finder or to a jury, they get it. Yeah. Exactly. They get it. And you humans don't... get it. It's more the, and we've been so conditioned. I mean, most insurances have the writers. You probably know more about this than I do that, that does not cover mold. It will sometimes cover water damage, which I've learned to really go for the water damage, the damage from the construction and not the mold itself, because many, many um, insurances or places have something that just excludes that because they know this is a big deal. And, you know, I, I was at a mediation and, um, they had not taken it very seriously. And suddenly the the insurance lawyer was like, well, I mean, I, I just, this is, you know, mold cases are very explosive. I just haven't, I haven't given the, the warning up the chain, you know, and we've got trial in two weeks and I'm kind of like, yep. Uh -huh. <laughs> exactly like, it's Welcome to the party. Right, like, right. Where have you been? <laughs> Because juries care. So yes. I can't wait to have more jury trials. Yes. I can't wait yes. to have more jury trials. Um, I love they, that. they know. Yeah. And yes, the, the, and they know the danger of it. Mm -hmm. And they can see if we continue to allow this to happen, yeah. that could be my kid. Mm -hmm. And it's so invisible. And, and the invisibility of it is what makes, is that even a word, is what makes it so dangerous. Yes, yes. And that's what makes it so traumatic. Christina, I could talk to you forever. This is so fascinating. And I just, I want to say publicly and to you personally, I am so grateful. I'm so sorry that your family had to go through the suffering. And yet I'm so grateful that you're doing what you're doing. And that's my thought. I literally want to cry and give you a hug virtually when I found out what you were doing because we need you so bad. What can people do out there for supporting? I mean, obviously, we're going to list your number and make sure that anyone has questions calls your hotline and, and that can we uh, get more attorneys on board? What else do you need in this field? What do we need to change the tide? I want more lawyers to take these cases. I don't have a monopoly. I, if you are a lawyer and you're interested in taking these cases in any state, I will help you. There's no competition. I will give you everything that I have. I will give you all the resources, um, the draft petitions, the draft discovery. I will, I will give all of that to you for free. Oh. Um, so I always make time to talk to lawyers. If you're a lawyer listening and you're interested in this, please reach out to me. Um, but the other thing I would say is continue to speak truth. Mm -hmm. That's what you're doing. And, and don't be afraid to your listeners. Don't be afraid because this is true. Yes. And if this happened to you, it's real. And it really happened to you. And that's okay. We, we can move beyond it. You don't have to make this your life mission or anything. It's just, Jill and I happen to do that because it yes. does particular things in our lives. And that doesn't mean you need to, but please know that you're not alone. And if you're in a toxic place, I know Dr. Jill has a lot of resources for this, but please start to make your way out because you can't get well until you get out. Yes. Let me say that again. You can't get well until you get out. And I unfortunately have had four clients die in the homes I told them to leave. Mm. Please don't be one of them. 
Miss Fina, yeah. this may be one of the most important podcasts we've ever done. And I love that you just spoke to those listeners out there with that. I say that all the time in clinical practice. And yet I know the trauma of leaving your safe place of your home. I know the expense. I know the devastation. I know how hard this is. So just like you, I want to speak to you listening out there if you know that there's mold in your home. And you know, it's, it's so interesting because often in my clinical practice, I'll be talking to the patients, getting their history. I know between the data, the intuition and their story, I'm certain there's a mold exposure and my staff actually jokes because pretty much right now I'm 100% accurate on that. <laughs> and that's not to say I've just been through it so I know it, but all that to say, I've had over just like you with these patients that have or clients that have actually passed away in the home, patients that deny it or they're not able to kind of grasp this for years. And then finally they'll come back and say, you were right, right? So now is a better time than waiting. And yet we both acknowledge this is hard, hard stuff. So reach out, get a physician. Um, there's resources, uh, groups like ICI out there. And then Christina, where can people find you? Where can they get a hold of you um, for, in your resources? So so check me out on Instagram, just well law on Instagram. And then our website is well.law. Well.law. And we will be sure and post that. And then we'll have to have uh, part number two for a follow up for this. I hope so. I hope so. We can talk for hours. Yeah. I can't wait to meet yeah. in person sometime and yes. to be continued. Thank 